This year is gonna be 17 years since I opened a DAW for the first time of my life. And I took a couple of weeks to reflect on the past 17 years and come up with a couple of things that I wish I knew earlier. And those things I wanna share today with you. So stay tuned. What's up everybody, I'm Alex at GeneralGeibel.com Today we're gonna talk about 10 things that I wish I knew earlier In this video I'm gonna share my top 10 realizations that I wish it wouldn't take me 17 years to figure out and I wish somebody told me 17 years ago They are not in any particular order or anything like that So let's get right into it Number 1 It's not about the tools this is something that was a big fucking deal in the first couple of years. I always thought like I need to write plugins, I always thought like I need to write the AW. Back in the day when I started, Pro Tools HD was a big fucking deal, so I thought I need to get into Pro Tools. Didn't get the HD, couldn't afford it, but I worked with Pro Tools, I switched to Logic, because that was also a big fucking deal, especially for electronic music and stuff. I wish I knew earlier that all that stuff is really not important. It's really not about the tools, it's about like what you make out of those tools that are available to you. Nowadays I don't look at DAWs or plugins like something that is a must have or something like that. I look at them more like tools that promote certain workflows or slow down other workflows and stuff like that. As a quick example, if I produce tracks in Ableton Live, I work differently than if I produce tracks in Logic Pro. And this goes for synthesizers, for all types of plugins and stuff like that. After 17 years, I came to realize it's really not about the tools, it's how you use them and what you're using them for. And you would be surprised how little tools you need and how much you can get done just in every common and professional DAW. Number two, there are no secrets. This is a point that was fucking my brain for many years. I couldn't get my masters as loud as like the big hits that you've been hearing on the dance floors. And I was always thinking like, okay, they probably have like some secret plugin, they probably have some secret hardware, they probably have some secret trick or something like that. And nowadays I came to realize there is nothing out there that is a secret or nothing else. It's usually just repetition and experience. And we're gonna talk about that as well, because this sums up pretty much everything else. But trust me, I spent a lot of time and I spent a lot of resources to look for and find those secrets and I came to realize there are no secrets, there are no secret plugins, there is nothing else. If there is something around that makes like a big fucking deal, everybody will talk about it. That's for sure. Number three, you don't need hardware. This is also something that I was believing for many years and if you talk to people who have shit tons of hardware they will still convince you that you need those analog synthesizers, you need those analog compressors and EQs and shit like that. But the reality is this. The majority of hits done nowadays are done mostly in the box. And especially I would probably argue 90% of all hard dance music is done in the box as well. So if you think you need to spend like a couple of grand on a mastering compressor or if you think you need to spend a couple of grand on a hardware synthesizer that's not gonna change the world for you trust me on that i had a couple of hardware synthesizers i also worked in studios which had like very expensive mastering gear summing boxes and stuff like that it makes a difference, it's a different sound, but it doesn't necessarily make it bigger or better or anything like that. Again, it depends on how you use it and it can make a small difference, but the difference is probably something in the lines like having like 0.3 dB louder master compared to a lower master. It's not that big difference that would justify having a shit ton of hardware. If you have money lying around, this is absolutely a great investment you can make. It also makes a lot of fun to play with that stuff, but you shouldn't get that shit because you think you will have an edge compared to others. Number four, the idea is more important than the quality. 
This is something I'm also guilty myself. I always was very much focused on having like the best quality that I could get. And I would be absolutely willing to sacrifice the idea to have the best sounding track I can possibly get. Nowadays, I see it completely differently. If I was DJing, I was still collecting tracks which are good enough quality wise. That's important that they're good enough, but that the track itself is about something. In other words, it has some good ideas. And also for the label and all that stuff. I don't care too much about like the highest quality of the highest quality if the track is about nothing. If the track has something charming, has something interesting, evokes some emotion in people and maybe the quality is not the best but it's good enough, it's good enough for me. It's always good to have the best quality track with the best idea but if you can choose only one, nowadays I would choose the idea every single time. Number five. Mixing and mastering start a lot earlier. To this day, the majority of questions producers ask me are always related to mixing and mastering. Also, the most discussions and most videos on YouTube are also all about mixing and mastering. And I also thought like this is gonna be the biggest fucking deal of everything in your production. The final mixing stage and then the final mastering stage. Took me a long time to realize mixing really starts right from the start. With every sound you pick, with every note that you play. It makes a big difference if you have a certain sound and you play it an octave higher on an octave lower. So mixing really starts from the first note and mastering as well. Don't just throw a lot of shit in your arrangement and say like later on I'm gonna do some EQing and some compression and stuff like that. Look at mixing as something that takes something that is already great to just something amazing and mastering that just makes it loud. It took me a long time to realize and I hope you guys who watch this uh, will save uh, 10, 15 years of doing the same mistakes that I did. Just neglecting the whole part of like arranging and selecting sounds because you have the maddest mixing skills on the planet. Number six, take care of business to make more music. This is something very important and that is kind of a little bit controversial because a lot of you guys consider yourself artists and you don't really like to talk about money and everybody who makes money is kind of a dick or not an artist and stuff like that. But please listen to me and bear with me here right now. I was fortunate enough to start making money with production, mixing, mastering, with all that stuff, also a lot of live sound and stuff like that quite early on. Since about 2009 or 2010, something like that, I didn't have any job outside of music. But when it comes down to my own music, I wanted always to bring in a little bit more of an artist perspective. And I've been doing stuff in my music that I knew is not commercially viable, but I was like, oh, I love it, I'm gonna do it. If I look back to that nowadays, I would make also decisions I can live with that and I know that my track will probably reach people, will probably sell downloads, CDs, nowadays streams, whatever. Making money with your music allows you to make more music and this is actually the goal for everything. If you're serious about music, you really want to make as much music as you can and therefore it's important to have an eye on the business. Every minute you spend in the studio will drastically help you to improve on your music and if you are able to spend time in the studio and get paid for that, and make a living, this is the best situation you can be in. And I gotta say, from that moment I went full time with uh, being just involved with music, I improved in half a year a lot more than I improved in all those years before. And no matter how unsexy that shit is, it's definitely a good idea to have an eye on the business and be a little bit business minded and also try to make some money with your music and maybe even aim for going full-time at one point in your life. Number seven, personal relationships are far more important than social media. Nowadays, you probably know, we live in that time where everybody needs at least to have like 100,000 followers on Instagram and needs to have like 5,000 likes on every post in order to be considered to play on a small club event and get paid a little bit of money. 
The thing with that is we kind of really forget what is more important and what is also a little bit more efficient. Especially if you're on a lower level as a DJ and artist. Out of my experience, nobody is gonna book you because he finds you on Instagram or you have a little bit of following or you have a little bit of hype on Instagram and stuff like that. A lot of stuff happens with personal relationships. Pretty much every booking I played as General Geibel comes back to either my own personal relationship or a personal relationship which I had with my agent who had a personal relationship with some promoter. But it wasn't ever like that, that some promoter called up my agent and said like, we want General Geibel. It was always like some relationship which was in real life instead of social media. A lot of great things I've done in my life and a lot of great opportunities I had in my life came all pretty much through real life relationships instead of like social media. Sometimes cool things happen about social media, but you have a much bigger chance to move forward with being an artist and with like making some money and like uh, some business stuff if you are more focused on real life relationships instead of social media. Number eight, paid promotion is good. So this is something that's worth actually a full on video in my opinion. There's always something like, you know, people look down to other people who kind of take money in their hands and maybe run some Facebook ads or Instagram ads and shit like that. I also talked to a couple of people who are really proud about, I never spent a fucking cent in my life on promotion. Well, I personally think uh, promotion is a good thing and a lot of like mainstream artists definitely promote the shit out of everything they do. And here again, I get a lot of fucking spam. I get private messages with links, uh, people spam like fucking Facebook groups, people spam all over that place. And I guess there are pretty much zero to none results on that. So if they would spend that time to make a little bit more of money and put it into promotion, I mean, like with something like a budget of five euro, you can already reach like a couple of thousand people if you're smart about your ad. That's probably gonna be a lot of more reach than you sitting there every day and just being annoying to everybody and send like fucking DMs and shit with your links, which nobody's ever listening to. I never listen to a track, if, especially if somebody just posts a link without saying anything. That leaves like a fucking bad taste in my mouth and I kind of already think very bad about that person. And I could assume it's gonna happen to a lot of other people as well. This whole unsolicited uh, links sending out through DMs, it's fucking annoying and it's a waste of time to you as well. So if you have a little bit of money, why not spend it clever on a little bit of promotion to get your word out, especially if you have already some kind of little signs that you might be onto something and you might have something that people gonna like. Why not extend it? I'm spending like a shit ton of money on ads for my sample packs. And guess what? There are always a couple of people who complain and say like, oh, fucking hell and stuff. But a lot of people really discover my shit only through that. And a lot of people are very happy. Look at my site. We have a lot of really good reviews on the sample packs and stuff like that. And the majority of those people got to know about it through my ads. So it's not a bad thing after all, I would say. Number nine, knowledge is not power, experiences. Okay, this is the greatest thing of all I guess. Uh, this took me a long time. Personally I'm a little bit of an education junkie, right? I cannot stop to try to expand my knowledge and get smarter about things and learn new things. That's what I do, that's my thing. And I spent a shit ton amount of time on YouTube, on like reading, on doing anything except of being in a studio. And that fucking slowed me down a lot. Don't get down that rabbit hole that you spend days and days and days on YouTube and masterclasses and shit like that instead of on the studio. At the end of the day, it really, it all comes to the amount of time you spend in the studio. It can be very helpful to know what the fuck you're doing in a studio, but it's probably not as helpful than instead of just doing it. Because with every minute you spend in the studio, you kind of improve your hearing, you improve everything. You might not see it, but spend a year in the studio 
and there is no way in hell you won't be much better than you've been the year before. Knowledge is not power. Knowledge is very helpful and you shouldn't say like I'm gonna be a fucking dumb fuck and I don't wanna know anything and I just click around until I get something done. You should know what you're doing but if you are one of those guys and I know you guys, some of you write me up, oh I watched every masterclass, I watched this, I did that, I did that and I was like how much time do you spend in the studio? Yeah, like one hour a week. Yeah, that's not enough. You know, you should really change the ratio between like the amount of time you spend in the studio and the amount of time you educate yourself. That's something I wish I would have learned earlier because in the beginning of my career, I was spending way more time in learning new things instead of mastering the things that I do. Number 10, sound design is not important. I see already a lot of you guys getting really aggressive and writing down what the fuck do you know? I know a lot about that because I spent hours and years and years in improving in sound design because this is something that was told to me. You have to have your own sound. You have to be able to make sounds like that. A lot of hits are made with presets. And let me be very, very clear. If you love making sound design, and if you're good at sound design, if you can do it, whatever. It is a very valuable trait. I wouldn't ever dare to say it's not beneficial to be able to make your own sounds. It's a very good thing, but it's not mandatory. You can get a lot of shit done by choosing presets, tweaking them a little bit, do processing and stuff like that. A lot of people make a lot of great music who never made a single sound from scratch in their whole fucking life and they're still doing pretty amazing music. Just to make sure for all you butthurts. It is definitely valuable and if you have the skill and if you're able to make sounds, you're really much ahead. My biggest fucking mistake was I spent years and years and years to get good at sound design and I missed years and years and years in getting good at making music. If you are into making music and sound design is not your interest and not your thing, don't listen to all those fucking idiots who actually use presets themselves but always tell you like oh you have to make your own sounds from scratch and shit like that. Just do whatever feels right and nobody gives a flying fuck if your super saw is a preset or if you made it from scratch. Nobody cares. I wasted years of my life on learning sound design which I could have invested in getting better at music production and making music and whatever, everything music related. Nowadays it worked out for me pretty good because I do a substantial part of my living through sound design, through my sample packs and sound sets and stuff like that. So at the end it worked out great for me. But who knows how it would have worked out if I spent all that time in creating tracks and creating melodies and just master my craft in making music instead of making sound. Maybe I would make a substantial part of my living nowadays with music instead of with sounds. Those are my 10 things that I wish I really knew earlier. A couple of things in terms of production, a couple of things overall and a couple of things in terms of business. There are definitely a lot more things to talk about, especially in terms of production. So if you're interested in that, we can maybe make a part two. Please also share your thoughts. Please also share your experience because I'm very curious. What are those things that you came to realize that they were bullshit or a waste of time? And what are those things that you would have done differently if you would have started today? If you want to help a brother out, leave a like, leave a comment. The comment can be everything, can be a stupid emoji, can be a thumbs up, whatever you want to do. And if you're interested in more videos like that, I have two recommendations for you. The first one is going to an engineering school. Is it good? Is it worth it? Should you do it or shouldn't you do it? And the second one is ghost production. How to become a ghost producer. And pretty much all my experience about ghost production. So check them out. Stay tuned. Stay on my channel. Watch all my shit. Thank you very much. And I see you next time. Bye bye.